education. You're trying to give the young people something that will help them. Yet you don't know exactly what it ought to be. Welcome to the Teach Thought Podcast. Our mission is to rethink what's possible teaching and learning in a modern context. Join your classroom to the Teach Thought movement and be a part of the change. Today I talk with Nita Nehru. Nita runs community building initiatives at Kinsa, a company that builds app-enabled thermometers. Nita holds a master's degree from Columbia University and sits on the board of the Nanubai Education Foundation, an organization dedicated to improving education in rural India. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Nita. Nita, thanks for joining us today. Give our listeners some background information about you. Who are you and what are you interested in? What do you do? What do you love? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nita Nehru. I work on marketing and community initiatives over at Kinsa. Kinsa is a company creating um, a smartphone-enabled thermometer to better track and stop the spread of disease. Um, and on a personal level, I just moved to San Francisco from New York. I am really missing the hustle and bustle of Manhattan, but you know the the weather out here is beautiful in San Francisco. And um, that's a that. So wait, you moved from where to where? New York to San Francisco. That's a big change. It's a huge change. <laughs> it's a huge change. A huge cost country move. Yeah. Where in New York? I was in Manhattan, in Chelsea, Mm -hmm. and we now are in the heart of San Francisco, sort of down in the Soma area, Mm -hmm. where all the all the tech startups are. Yeah. So, what caused that move? Uh, There are a few reasons. One is the the company. My husband actually happens to be the founder and CEO of Kinsa, so we're Mm -hmm. (laughs) we're running a family enterprise over here. Um, Do you have to apply for the job? You know, people people kind of laugh, but I think I had one of the most rigorous interview processes. I had to interview with every single person in the company to make sure that I was a fit. And, you know, my big thing was I want to be at the company despite the fact that I'm your wife, not because of the uh-huh. fact that I'm your wife, you know? Yeah, so yeah. I spent a lot of time and effort in my education and in, you know, working. And I don't want to be somewhere just because I'm some dude's wife, right? So... <laughs> <laughs> Some dude, I'm sure he would appreciate that. <laughs> we won't tell him I said that. Hopefully he doesn't. No, we won't. Hopefully he didn't listen to the podcast, right? But yeah, and, and so part of the reason for the move was that it's just great technology talent out here, right? Great engineering talent. It's the hotbed of of startups and kind of wearable startups, the Internet of Things startups, which is what we sort of categorize ourselves as. And secondly, uh, a purely personal reason to move. Um, as much as I loved New York, I was really far from my family. My parents were in Seattle. My sisters are in LA. I'm a hop, skip and a jump away now. So yeah, New York's a crazy place. Uh, especially for me, I'm being from Kentucky. It's the, our biggest cities, Louisville and, you know, maybe over a million people, but there's like a million people in Manhattan, like on three square blocks. It's amazing. I go yeah. to that city and it is, it is intoxicating. So the moment I step out of the subway the city is just alive and electric. There's just this energy that's really, it's its hard to put your finger, because you go to Vegas, you go to LA, and you go to the, all these Miami and these other places, and there's something really unique about all of these places. But New York, you can just feel this in, extraordinary sense of both history, which is weird, and in light of all the mar- modern architecture and everything. There's this really cool sense of history. Maybe I've just watched Gangs of New York. <laughs> And then there's also this very modern sort of aesthetic. And then it's crazy. People are oh. crazy. The lines at Starbucks, there's they're like 70 people. They're so in nostalgic. Line. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, there's just something amazing. But I can't do it for more than two or three days. Four or five days, I'm done. You know, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like it, the energy is what I find. I really miss it about New York. And when I first moved there, I moved there for graduate school. And my first few months there, I was like, I don't get what all the fuss is. I mean, it's a nice city, but I don't get it. And two years in, I was just, I was hooked. It's, you, you kind of yeah. feed off the energy. And I think an certain addiction. people do and others don't. We have friends who come and they're like, get me away from this crazy <laughs> place. But, you know, I was there for seven years and it was, it is just amazing. It's a great, great place. Yeah, it's- it's palpable. I mean, there's, it's just, it's really interesting. Maybe just for me growing up there, maybe your people wouldn't be aware of it, but coming from Kentucky and going to New York, it's like another dimension. I can it is the whole new extraordinary. World. It is. And so how have you found San Francisco in terms of, um, 
how it in, impacts your business and your opportunities? You know, so business wise, I think it's, it was definitely the right move. There, there's incredible talent out here. People who've done it before, who've scaled businesses like ours, um, people who are hungry to join a mission driven startup. And it, so, so business wise, it's been great. The, the city itself, I mean, it's beautiful. You can't say anything about that. It's beautiful, great weather. Um, I am still getting used to things shutting really early, having to get dinner by nine o'clock because everything is going to close. But I think long term, it'll be definitely the right decision for us. Well, tell me about that mission then. You mentioned a mission. What is the mission? Yeah. So um, one thing I think is pretty unique about Kinsa is that we were actually founded with a mission before we even had a product. So we actually worked backwards. And the mission is to help track and stop the spread of disease. Um, my, my husband, the founder of Kinsa, Inder Singh, he has a background in public health, and he was the executive vice president of the Clinton Health Access Initiative uh, a few years ago. And during his time there, he kind of found that, you know, governments and society spend so much money trying to stop the spread of disease. It's one of the single biggest challenges in public health is stopping the spread of disease. But we do so with such little information about when and where disease is spreading. So how do you put money and resources towards something effectively if you don't know where to put them? So that was the mission that we were founded with was, you know, how do we track the spread of disease so that we can do our best to stop it? And so that was the mission. And we worked backwards from there and said, all right, how can we actually get data from someone who has just fallen ill to give us the information we need to help map human health, you know, to help know where it's spreading, and at the same time, give someone who's just fallen ill the information they need to get better, better. And the answer to that was, let's do it with the world's most common medical device, a thermometer. You know, it's a device that almost everyone, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're in the developed or the developing world, it's something people have access to. It's something people recognize. And parents, especially, are power users of thermometers. And children just happen to be um, the, the primary spreaders of illness because their immune systems aren't built up yet. And so um, targeting parents who use thermometers you know, profusely to help their children was sort of our way into that system to create a real-time map of human health. So what can a thermometer do? Sure. How can a thermometer help? What, what is the role of the thermometer in this grand scheme of human health? Sure. So fever in and of itself is not a problem necessarily, right? A fever is an indication that there's something happening in your body, something that needs attention. A thermometer is the first device a lot of people go to to confirm an illness, especially, again, parents, right? So an unconnected, like analog thermometer can't do much. It gives you a number. It says, you know, 101 degrees. All right, you know something's wrong with your body. A connected thermometer, however, gives us the opportunity to gather a lot more data than the unconnected counterparts. So in addition to capturing a user's temperature, there's an app that works with our thermometer that allows you to input symptoms that you're experiencing. So let's say sore throat, um, a rash, runny nose, you know, body aches and pains. So you can input that into the app. You can also input pictures. So if you have a rash, you put in a picture. Um, medication, notes, things like that. So that's playing actually a dual purpose. One is giving the user immediate value, right? You're able to track the progression of your illness. And let's say you're a parent. You go to the doctor and you say, this is exactly what my child had. Because you know when you go to a doctor, the pediatrician is going to ask you, how high was the fever? How did it progress? What other symptoms did she have? And you know, as a parent, you have a lot of things going on. There's not, you know, it's not necessary that you'll remember all the details. And an, an old school way of doing this is tracking everything on, on a piece of paper, right? So that's the immediate value to the user. Now, broader, broadly speaking, for us, we're also gathering that data that we need to start mapping health. So we know that in Louisville, someone had a 100 degree fever with aches, pains, and a sore throat. Now, if we see that start to progress in your area, you can make inferences from that. And we take our data and combine it with other publicly available data sources, such as the CDC, um, Google Flu Trends, 
um, other, other things that do social media mining for, for illness. And you start to get a sense of where things are spreading. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, yeah, it does. So let me stop you. Social media mining for illness. Please tell me more. I mean, I get it. I can, I can guess what it is, but tell me what you Yeah, know. It's, it's a weird concept, um, and it's a concept that does have some issues with it, but to be honest, it's a huge step forward. So what social media mining for illness means is if you're sick, let's say you go to Twitter and you say, I've got a fever. You know, someone help. <laughs> what do I do? So things like Google flu trends, they mine the internet for those type of mentions on social media sites, so Facebook. Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. I mean, I doubt anyone's using LinkedIn to talk about their illness, but you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and they capture that information. And so they can start to create a, a bit of information around when and where disease is spreading. But there, there's challenges with that, right? There's natural language processing challenges. So for example, I have a fever and I have Bieber fever are two very different things. And saying- I think there's a lot more in common there than <laughs> people would imagine. <laughs> You might be right. You might be right. Um, but so, yeah, so there's certain challenges with social media mining, but it was a huge leap forward, right? I mean, in the past, data to the CDC and data that you get from doctor's offices is three, four weeks delayed. And by the time that's getting into the health system, hey, the flu's already spread, right? Mm. Well, let's take a, you know, extreme example, something like Ebola. I mean, I, it was a big thing last year. Three weeks late in Ebola is a lifetime. You've already infected thousands and thousands of people. So that's why, you know, we always like to say with Atkinsa that we are not the be all and end all. We are one data point. But if you have highly geolocated, medically accurate data that you're able to combine with other data sets like CDC, social media mining, you're able to start to create a much richer more accurate picture of when and where disease is spreading. So, you know, pharmaceutical companies and individuals, doctor's offices are more prepared to, you know, to take action. You get to know where the flu is spreading and the flu kills hundreds of thousands of people a year just in the U.S. alone. I mean, it's, it's crazy to think about, but something as simple as the, the yearly flu kills people still, the elderly and the young. So if we were able to know where the flu is starting, you know, wh when it starts, where it starts, you're able to put money and resources much to much better use in those areas. It's interesting that we go to one of the least credible sources of information uh, on earth, like Twitter, yep. which is either really credible formal brands and news brands, or it's just a cesspool of trolling. And, but it's, it's, it's the human chatter of a connected world. Yeah. Twitter's is that chatter space. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. I've, I've thought of, um, I've been thinking of health a lot recently in terms of kind of the Western view of health, which has typically been really reactive. Yep. What can Western healthcare learn from other, the way other cultures think about health mm -hmm. and this new player in the health field, which is user-based technology rather than doctor-based technology? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's a few different ways of thinking about that question. One is the whole big quantified self movement, right? That's becoming very popular and it's, sort of what you're referring to with, with wearables, wearable technology, people wanting to have their own data at their fingertips. How much did I walk today? Did I consume too many calories? Um, you know, what is my overall fitness level like? So that's one aspect of it. And that's more, I think, you know, personal, more fitness-based. To me, I wouldn't call it necessarily health uh, as, a, as an all-encompassing term. To me, wearables and things like that are more fitness. When you start talking about health, I think it's more diagnostic space. So things like a connected thermometer, things like um, there's the Scanadu Scout tricorder that gives you things like your, your blood pressure and other health-related diagnostic measures. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a, there's a huge opportunity for us now that so many things are becoming connected to start to reap value, not just from the tool itself, but from what you can do by connecting it to the cloud, for example. And now you're starting to create a repository of information. You're starting to connect various, let's say, home-based healthcare products to one another to derive 
you know, tremendous amount of value from them, a lot more value than you could from each one individually. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. as you're talking, I'm trying to think about what should be connected. You know, yeah. sh what's worth connecting? What are the causes and effects and the impacts of connecting this to that? If it, once things are connected, ecologies change. And so yeah. I mean, what's worth connecting? That That's the million dollar question. I, I think in the last couple of years, we've seen a huge explosion in connecting things for the sake of connecting them because it's a cool thing yeah. to do, right? Like we recently saw a, a connected belt buckle. Not sure what that does. And I think um, Inder says it really, really well, which is, you know, don't connect things for the sake of connecting them. Connect them if once it's connected, it provides you inherently more value, right? Um, and at the same time, if connecting something can lower the price of the product, then you're doing it correctly. Because if you think about it, like just taking our thermometer as one example, the actual thermometer itself has no batteries, has no processor, has no LCD. It will eventually become one of the cheapest thermometers to ever be manufactured because we are leveraging all the power and processing capabilities of the smartphone, which is, oh, by the way, one of the most powerful tools ever invented, right? So once you connect something, you should be deriving inherently more value out of it. It should be cheaper for the common user, and it should be able to do a heck of a lot more. And again, because I have the most you know, knowledge of our thermometer, taking that as an example, well, not only are we giving you your temperature readout, but we're able to map human health eventually with it. So, so I think to, to answer your question, this was a roundabout way of doing it, but to answer your question, it's connect things if they provide inherently more value to the user. Don't connect things for the sake of connecting them because it's the cool thing to do. Like, you know, unless a connected desk gives me some other sort of value rather than just being able to say, woo, I have a connected desk. Don't connect it. Yeah, right. Well, I had to admit the the first time I saw the thermometer and in, plugged into the cell phone, I thought, okay, you're like, why? Okay, wait a minute. Why would I why? do that? <laughs> I, I well, it. I mean, it looks cool, and I get there's a temptation. Yep. But I didn't really get it. Yep. And which is why I ask a follow up question, and I uh, got a thermometer myself, and have been talking a little bit of, about it with you and with my doctor as well, trying to understand. And I think that the understanding is probably what's most important because a lot of things don't seem credible or worthwhile or, or useful because a lot of times we're applying old ways of thinking to new ideas and possibilities. Yep. So when the first time I saw a, a wearable, a, a watch, a smart watch, I thought, why, why do I want to look at my watch to get a message. Why do I want to get it, look at my watch to, I'm not going to talk to my watch. This is ridiculous. That would be amazing the, the, I, if you did though. I would love to right, see that. Well, <laughs> yeah. You know, I've, I've, every single time I saw a wearable, I thought what we are getting addicted to this idea of technology and we're digitizing everything. And this is ridiculous. I'm not buying a watch, a smart watch or a wearable. I'm out, get off my lawn and take your wearable with you. Right. So then I, the Microsoft band caught my eye. You know, I've been looking a little bit about at Android Wear and obviously the Apple Watch, but the Microsoft band was a lot less expensive. I eventually uh, it went on sale on Amazon. I bought one. It was like 90 bucks, I think. This thing has changed the way I think about my phone. First of all, I, I touch my phone about 70% less. Wow. So there's no need to constantly get open my phone, check for notifications or all the notifications, text messages, emails, they're all pushed to the phone. So I can check them and prioritize accordingly. There's a vibration that uh, alerts me, that gives me different levels of vibrations for different notifications. It has an ultraviolet, uh, I don't know what it's called, camera or some sort of tool to measure ultraviolet light and give me warnings if, if there's too much ultraviolet light and how quickly I might burn. Um, it has a Starbucks app on it. There are so many things that this, this little $90 wearable can do that I never would have thought about before. Heart rate sensors, it tracks your sleep. So, you know, there are apps that track sleep on your phone, but this is a lot more, well, I think it's supposed to be a lot more precise because it's touching your skin and it's monitoring your pulse rate. And so it's better than the phone under your pillow. It's actually, you wear it to sleep. 
And so this is giving me a, giving me a more fuller view of my sleep. If you'd have told me five years ago I was going to use a bracelet to measure my sleep and my heart rate and to understand ultraviolet light exposure and to touch my phone less, I wouldn't have. It wouldn't have made sense to me. But now that I wear one, I think about a wearable technology differently, and it opens up a whole new realm of possibilities. When should I go do yoga? When should I do my exercise? When should I? When is an ideal time for a nap? These sorts of things now. I have schema for them. I have background knowledge. I have I have a tendency to think about them because the technology is there. Yeah. So it seems ridiculous at first. It's not so ridiculous after you begin to use it for a while and, and change the way you think about things. Yeah. That's, that's interesting that you say that, though, because, you know, in my experience, a lot of technologies that require behavior change aren't mm -hmm. as successful as technologies that piggyback off of existing behavior. Does that make sense? So yeah. The wearables, I don't know if you know this, but the average lifespan of a user using a wearable is about three months. So mm. something, I'm not talking about the watches, but like a, like a Fitbit, something like that. It's three months because at first it's a, this novelty and you know, you're using it, you're tracking your, your steps and did I get to 10,000 steps today? And it's kind of gamified and, and you're interested in it. But then after a while, unless you actually change your behavior, the novelty wears off and you're done. Um, one of the reasons we chose to do a thermometer was because we're not requiring you to change your behavior. It's very common practice for a parent to take a child's temperature, but now we're just connecting it and giving more value out of that process. So I would love to talk to you in like four months from now and see if you're still using the, the watch. But I think the watch is different because you're getting inherently more value out of this watch than you would be otherwise, correct? I'm, I'm listening to what you're, you're saying, and I definitely agree that if you have, if it doesn't require a change in user behavior, mm -hmm. it ha stands to be more, stands to be more successful. But then I might also argue that if the technology isn't ultimately changing my behavior, then I wonder about its inherent value because the the net result I would think should be a change in understanding or a change in behavior. Yeah. So I'm using this data or this information or this technology or this source in order to inform my behavior so that I can adapt it and increase or optimize the things that I do. But that's a really yeah. good point. Yeah, that's a really good point. Talking about technology and our kind of its ubiquitous nature in, in our daily lives, screen time is increasingly becoming a, a hot button topic for, for teachers, for parents, and really for friends at, at dinner together, checking their phone constantly. Yeah. What are your thoughts personally on um, kind of balancing or should there be a balance between how we use technology and, and how we don't use technology? Should it be intertwined and ingrained in what we do so it kind of becomes invisible and retreats to the background? Mm -hmm. Or should we sort of cleave it cleanly from, from non-technology time and, and actually have that space? Oh, such what, a what hard question. You know, and completely speaking, just purely from a personal perspective, um, I, I will tell you, I... I find it very sad that technology is so intertwined in our lives it, for, for certain reasons. I think, you know, I've seen how it changes the way I interact with people. I, I, I'm a huge, you know, culprit. I am on my phone 24 seven. It's a huge pet peeve that my friends have with me. Um, and I in turn do it with my husband because he running this company is always connected. And it's, I mean, at dinner, once we get into bed, it's the first thing he does in the morning and, you know, to be honest, I think that's how a lot of people do it. And I think it's very sad because it's in a lot of times, in a lot of ways, starting to take the place of true interpersonal contact. Like I feel just as connected to a friend if I text them, as if I call them, as if I even see them. Right. So it's in that sense of the word, it's, it's sad to me. About a year ago, I never really liked Facebook. Yeah. So ever since it came out, I just, I was very, uh, I don't know. I just oversimplified it as some big blue hued monster that I wanted nothing to do with. And I didn't like Zuckerberg and I didn't want, you know, I didn't want anything to do with Facebook. What I did was to me, it seemed like it provided this illusion of connectivity that wasn't there. And so what would ultimately happen would be because I was quote unquote, seeing people on Facebook it seemed to reduce the need that I felt to make a real authentic connection with yeah. them. So it provided this artificial sort of diet version of interaction mm -hmm. 
that 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 wasn't nutritional, that wasn't where yeah. it needed to be. And so what I did is I made the decision that pretty much everybody I cared about, especially within my fam, close friends and family, I defriended them, uh, and I didn't. <laughs> And I didn't tell them, I didn't warn them ahead of time. So I got a few uh, a text messages after that. But to me, it was a compliment. And that's what I, way I had to describe it to people. I said, this is a compliment because if I really want to spend time with you, I don't want to see you on Facebook. I want us to spend time together. Yeah, I have to make the effort. So yeah, make the effort because what I'm doing is I'm getting this little digital bites of connectivity that are maybe artificially reducing this authentic need for us to connect and sit down together and talk. I've since softened that stance. <laughs> you had a little to bit. refriend people. <laughs> I, I had to refriend a few folks, and then my mom she kept sending me friend <laughs> requests, and I declined my mom's friend request probably four times. And she didn't call me or anything. She just she'd send it again, and I would decline, and she'd send it again, and I say, "Okay, fine, mom." So yeah, that's but that's been an interesting uh, exercise, and I wanted to see if I wasn't close to these people on, or if I didn't connect with them on Facebook, what would happen. You know, and I guess it's easy to oversimplify this, but to say, well, if we're not connecting outside of Facebook, then we must not have really been friends. Yeah. And that's kind of true, I guess. And then I realize I'm also getting in the age where all of my friends, we had so much time together when we were 25. Well, now that you're, now that I'm 40, it's not, it's, that's not the case anymore. Yeah. So Everyone's anyway, kids in life. I mean, yeah, there's so many ways we could take that conversation and it's, and it's yeah. a fascinating topic. It really is because on the flip side from what you were saying does Facebook allow you to kind of expand your friend network? And am I in touch with people who I wouldn't be otherwise? Yeah. And am I able to make some semblance of a friendship? Yeah. And I think that's pretty cool. Like, you know, for example, we moved to San Francisco and I put on Facebook, you know, oh, moving to San Francisco. And, and all these people that I hadn't talked to since undergrad were like, hey, look me up when I'm here. You know, would love to hang out, show you the city. So is there value in that? Definitely. But, yeah. But at what cost is something that I frequently think of. And again, I'm on Facebook. I'm, you know, definitely one of the people that spends time Facebook stalking people. So I, I shouldn't be on any high horse or anything. But it's, yeah, it's true. It's an interesting conversation to have. Yeah. Yeah. Face, social media in general just encourages this judgment. Like it's so easy to judge people, you know, judge other people's habits and have this idea that this is the right way to do it and you're doing it wrong. Or feel bad about your own, right? I mean, there's or feel bad about so your own, much right? literature out there about how Facebook and other social media stuff actually makes people depressed because you feel, you know, my life isn't as cool. My life's not as exciting. And there was a fascinating yeah. um, senior project or something a, a girl in the Netherlands did. I don't know if you heard about this, but... Um, I read about it a couple of years ago. She actually, for her senior project, pretended, like used Facebook to create an illusion of a summer spent traveling in Asia. She never once left her home, hometown of, I don't know, Rotterdam or Amsterdam, never once left. But based on the pictures and the captions that she chose to put on Facebook, she was able to create this alternate reality of having traveled in Asia, which I thought was just a brilliant and fascinating um, senior project because it's so true. You can project whatever you want. I agree with that 100%. I've noticed that what social media does is allows people at least the opportunity to put forward the best version of themselves, mm -hmm. the best meal they had that day, the best angle with the best filter for their selfie. <laughs> uh, it, it allows them to go back and edit ideas. So it really allows people to project this sort of image of themselves. It's not entirely true. And I see people all the time, friends and relatives, that if you judge them based on their Facebook or, or their Twitter account, you would think one thing about them. Yeah. And then I know the reality of it. And so I'll see, for example, and this is kind of a sort of a saltier example, but I see a couple that I know who on Facebook, they look so happy together. Yeah. Oh, they're so in love. And look at this vacation. Smiles everywhere. Smiles and smooch, kiss, I love you. And I know they're not happy. I know they're yeah. not happy. It's weird how we almost use this digital stimulus and this digital space to lie to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We let ourselves be lied to. You know, at some point that may kind of substitute for reality. In other words, that may be the reality Online may be the reality and then offline because meaning exists in the mind of the user. You're creating meaning on a moment by moment basis. And if you can choose to, you know, create meaning however you would like. And of course, I don't think that's going to happen right away. But long term, you know, Zuckerberg bought, I think he bought, was it Oculus Rift, the virtual reality mm -hmm. headset? And the idea is to eventually 
you'll be able to sit on your couch with this headset on or some version of it 10, 15 years from now and watch television or, or sit in some quote unquote digital living room with people from all around the world. So you don't have to be, you're no longer space bound. You, you can, you're no longer limited by the geography of connections. My first thought was if I'm sitting there with a headset on with somebody in LA, I'm going to feel ridiculous. <laughs> You know, and it's not, I'm not sitting with them. I'm not. I'm sitting with a headphone or a headset on, and so are they a thousand miles away. It's not the same thing. But then if we uh, attach meaning and a sort of um, intellectual currency and substance to those interactions, then we as human beings will be able to really value that. And it may one day feel the same as sitting. You might sit on your couch and appreciate that every bit as much as if they were actually on the couch next yeah, to Yeah, but think about it from a flip side, uh, you know, for people, let's say spouses who are overseas, military families, right? Imagine right. that the connection that you could get with your spouse or your children when you are, you know, thousands and thousands of miles away, but you're able to feel that connection. So in certain ways, I think it could be phenomenal. But in other ways, it's, it, it's, just, it's just scary. It's just downright scary. <laughs> Well, the uh, artificial intelligence, there, there are some people that spend their lives dedicated to researching, designing, exploring, and understanding artificial intelligence. And the theory is artificial intelligence is, is the purest evolution of what it means to be alive. Throughout human history, and I guess even before human history, it's all been a push that's ultimately going to peak in, in digital artificial intelligence. And that's where meaning will, will live forever. This idea of of inhabiting physical bodies with our current limitations is is a very temporary thing. Yeah, that that's something. I mean, the words you just said, I don't think I can comprehend <laughs> quite yet. I don't think they fully make sense. It's just crazy. A lot of people are really really interested in it, and and sort of the the middle ground is this <clears throat> this movement called transhumanism. This idea of modifying yourself through technology, biologically modifying yourself with technology. And these things exist. I saw on Reddit the other day, there was a, there's something called the North Star. And it's basically an implant that you put underneath your skin. It's a series of lights. And when they, when they scanned a certain way, at first I thought it, it was kind of compassed. It pointed to magnetic north. And then I realized it's just an aesthetic. It's just lights that light up underneath your skin. Oh, it's not like but, biomarkers or anything like that. It's just, it's truly, it's like a tattoo, but under your underneath skin. Underneath the skin and it's electronic. But that is that's just one of many 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 ways technology instead of just like uh, artificial legs or I saw the other day somebody did and I mentioned this in a recent podcast they they use titanium titanium to 3D print a rib cage so the rib cage the person needed a whole not for a model but an actual functioning yeah, rib yeah. cage so they replaced somebody's rib cage with one 3D printed so these are sort of just sort of replacements for broken human parts but the idea ultimately is biomodification and then eventually transcending into pure digital existence. You know, really for me, it's kind of interesting because there's this weird sort of dichotomy for me where I'm fascinated about technology and I think it's amazing. And I also think it's the root of maybe uh, maybe the majority of the world's problems. That's a whole other podcast to kind of qualify that statement. But I just think it's both horrendous and, and fascinating at the same time. I agree. Um, and you can't. Yeah, and you can't also you can't think of technology just as digital wearable gadgets and apps and phones. You know, you got to think of plastic, and you know that's the technology, and you know the way we build houses and clean water and all that. So, it has been wonderful talking to you today, Nita. Tell tell the listeners where they can find out more about you, and your company, and what you do online. Sure. Um, so you can visit us at www.kinsahealth. It's k-i-n-s-a health dot com. Um, you can get a thermometer online from our website. You can buy it off of Amazon. We're also in Apple stores and at Best Buy and CVS. And if you'd like to learn more about me, um, I can't imagine why you would, but, <laughs> but if you would, uh, I'm on LinkedIn and, and Twitter and also on the Kinsa Health website. And Facebook. And but Facebook. That's a, but, different, but, that's a different thing. That's a whole different ballgame. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Nita. Have Thank a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Terry. Talk to you soon. All right. That'll do it for today. Thanks for listening. If you didn't hate it, please give us a quick review on iTunes. We record weekly. Questions? Email us at podcast at teachthought.com or find us on the Teach Thought Twitter account at Teach Thought. Until next time, keep asking why.